Good evening, friends. God bless you. And welcome to Metanoia Ministry. I believe that this is a God-appointed time where God is going to show his heart for you. And we are going to learn from scriptures. My name is uh, Raj Mekwan, and I'm speaking from Garni, Illinois. And like every time we start, I still like to, um, like every time, I wanted to explain what metanoia word means. It's a Greek word which is translated in our English Bible as repentance. However, you are aware that Greek language is much richer um, in, in, its, uh, in explaining the word uh, or the meaning of those words. Our understanding of repentance is when we cry or we feel sorry. In some cases, that is true. When our emotions run high, uh, we cry. But metanoia has a li little larger meaning of uh, what, what our understanding of repentance is. It has to do with uh, our understanding of or the per perception of a person. So in this case, like if you are thinking that God is angry God, God is against me, God is there to punish me, God is there to keep all the list of my wrongdoing, and then that is how I got sick, that is how I, I got in the situation I am in. If that is your understanding, and now after listening this message, if you, if your thinking changes, and if you if you start believing that no, God is a loving Father, He is not there to punish me; He is there to help me. He is not against me; He is for me. Then you did metanoia. You have changed your understanding of God, and my prayer is that God will make it happen. So let us start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we know that this is a appointed time here where you wanted to understand who you are. Then Holy Spirit, help us to open our eyes and learn from you. Lead us into understanding and knowing our Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. And I also wanted to say that why we have this understanding of God as an angry God. Why we have this cured view of um, God. There will be two reasons. One is devil doesn't want us to understand. Because if we know who God is, if we know what his heart is, then we would have a relationship. The most of the relationships are broken between people is that they don't understand each other completely. They don't know each other's heart. And our relationship with Father also, our God, is broken because our society, our upbringing, what we see around us has shaped our understanding and our perception of God. We live in a society which rewards the good things and punishes the bad things. From our childhood, early childhood, we are rewarded for good behavior and we are punished for the bad behavior. So we know that and we, there is a moral compass in each one of us that tells us that if we do something wrong, whether we agree with it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, or whether we say it or not, we know that this thing is not right. This is wrong. And based on our, our, our knowledge, we build this understanding that, okay, I did something wrong, so how can God bless me? How can God be for me? I, 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 will, I will get some way or another way I will be punished. And we have this concept of karma that do good, get good, do bad, get bad. But that's not the how Bible describes us. 
who God is. Today we are going to study Psalm 1. I think uh, I will uh, we'll go through all Psalms because they are beautiful. Um, king David was a king, but he was also a prophet. And so many Psalms he contributed to David. And this is the first Psalm we are going to study today. Let me read from New King James Version uh, of Psalm 1. There are very only six verses, but um, they are very powerful. Let me read Psalm 1. It starts like this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall pr prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And the, the, the funny thing is that the very first uh, word starts here. It says, blessed is, blessed is the man. And the Hebrew word for blessed is asher. And actually, uh, the true meaning of Hebrew word asher, which is translated as a as a blessed is happy. So if you wanted to read this Psalm 1 1, it goes like this Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of ungodly. So this this psalm starts and describes how a person can be happy. Now if you <laughs> I read a um uh story which is not true but and it is a funny story kind of a joke but it gives some perception behind the happiness so um, one man was walking and he saw a young man sitting under a tree and sleeping so he went to him and said that hey what are you are doing here he said that i'm just resting i'm just happy here and then the guy said, look at, look at you. You are a young man. You are capable. So you should go and work. And, and the guy said that, okay, then what? When you work, you earn money. And then what? When, I have, when you have money, then you get married. And then what? He keep asking, then what? And he said that when you have a wife and house, you will have children. And you will be happy. And the guy says that after doing all these things, I have to be happy. So why I have to do that? Because I'm already happy now. <laughs> the happiness is a, is, a, is a word that is hard to describe. And if somebody asks you what the happiness is, we can explain in, in, in terms of feeling. We can explain it, it, it uh, uh, our, uh, in terms of our emotions. Our joy, our content, our contentment, our gratitude. But the definition of, of uh, happiness is really complicated. What happiness is. In 2007, Sonja Lubonsky wrote a book called uh, The How of Happiness. And she defines the happiness in her book like this. The experience of joy, contentment, or positive well-being combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. That is called happiness. Again, 
it is it's a long definition what happiness is the happiness is the experience of joy contentment or positive well-being combined with a sense that one's life is good meaningful and worthwhile and happiness could be different for different people somebody would find that if i have a uh, so much money then i would be happy but you know that how many rich people has committed suicide so truly happiness looks like is not in money I have watched one of the old episode on Oprah Winfrey show where she invited a number of people uh, who won lotto, and they become a overnight millionaire. And most of them said that it would be better if we would not have won the money, because some people's kids went on a wrong way, some wives took a divorce and take half of the money. So money is not. the true happiness some people says that married and and getting married and remarry if you are getting divorced if you are not happy and marry with another woman uh, but if you look at the statistics that the people who are first time divorced and get married they are likely to get second time divorce very quickly the statistics does not support that if you get divorced and get married and then you become happy again some people say that they found happiness in drugs but the drug doesn't the effect of drug does not long, long enough last long enough you can smoke a cigar cigar cigarette whatever it is but it will give you some boost of feeling happy for a certain time but it will wear off any drugs any alcohol has a short time pleasure but it will not last so the happiness is not what we understand and that is why scripture is leading us that how can a person become happy what is what is the secret how you become a happy you you see god's desire for us to be happy god's desire and plan for you and me to be happy because he loves us when god created adam and eve and garden there was everything there for their pleasure they had a dominion on everything they had access to everything including the tree of life they were only forbidden to eat the the fruit from the uh, tree that gives them of we call it a good and evil but they had access to eat the fruit of life but they did not eat that contrary they eat the other fruit The, so God's original design was a perfect life, a happy life, a joyful life. And John ten ten, in John ten ten, Gospel of John chapter ten verse ten, Jesus says that I have come, that you have life and life of abundance, the prosperous, the fulfilling life. That is the reason, because the life that God has designed in Garden of Eden was taken away. and our bible list our god as a loving father who wants to restore what is taken away from us and that is why jesus said that i have come that you have life and life of abundance but the second part of that verse also says that but devil comes to kill steal and destroy devil wants to come and kill steal and destroy take away the joy and happiness from our life and jesus wants to restore it bible also says that in heaven 
There is no more tears. There is no more disease. There is no aging. It's a perfect life. God is calling us into So while we are on this earth, God wants us to have that fulfilling life. Not the life that, that we are looking around. A broken life. The life of tears. The life of abandonment. The life of loneliness. That is not God's plan. That is not God's design. That is not God's desire. When Jesus went to Jerusalem, he was crying. He was said that, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I tried to gather you under my wings, but you did not. Jesus uh, died a horrible death on the cross. If that death is just for our salvation, then why Jesus did not die a simple death like all the prophets, Abraham, Samuel, why like the King David? Why not the Old Testament saints like Old Testament saints? Why Jesus has to die a horrible death? Because the Bible says that through his strife we are healed. His body was broken so we can be healed from our sicknesses. It's not just that Jesus' death was not just for our salvation. Yes, it is for our salvation. But it's also while we are on earth, he wants to give us a, 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 a healthy Life. The Bible says that in his stripes we are healed. His body was broken. So we have a healing. Physical healing. The Hebrew word is for sozo. It's a complete healing. And after resurrection Jesus said that shalom. Shalom is not just a peace. It is a complete mind, body, soul. Complete. Shalom encompasses everything. The whole purpose of Jesus was that to restore the life that was lost. And one day, when we go to heaven, we will have what is taken away from us. So let us start when we are here. What Psalm is saying here in Psalm 1. He is describing a godly man who is blessed in another way, in Hebrew words, what is used for for a blessed, a share means happy. The man, godly man, who is a happy, and the ungodly man who is unhappy. Or his life is not what he is thinking to be. So very first verse goes like this. He, the man, blessed is the man. He is not walking in the counsel of ungodly, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of scornful. That is arrogant. So you see the progression here. The blessed man, the happy man. How he can be? The three things. That, that takes away the joy and happiness. Is not walking in the counsel of ungodly. Is so once you start walking, that means what, what Sam is saying here, if you start walking in the advice of ungodly, then what will happen? You will be start standing with the sinners. And then it will lead you to the arrogant life. You will, it says he sits in the uh, seat of the scornful man. There is a progression. And, and, and Bible is saying that the man who is a happy man, who he has found, does not do this. He, he doesn't walk in the advice of ungodly. That everybody wants to give their opinion. Everybody wants to advise us. We cannot stop it. People will give us advice all the time. It is us to desire. It is us to decide which advice we should take and which advice we should not take it. Jesus was God himself, but every morning he went out to pray. 
prayer is a communication. We can ask God. God said, ask me and I will answer you. Ask me and I will answer you. And God does talk with us. He talks with us all the time. He can provide us advice. Look for the advice from a godly people. Because when you start taking a good advice, you will not be standing in the, in the ways of the sinners. And that will not take you to become an arrogant. On the contrary, I mean, if, if you remember that, that King Solomon was the wisest person on the earth. But he married so many wives. The wives that were not Israelites. And he must be listening to them because he erected the idols for his wife. And he took their counsel. And we, we know that God has given that, that promise that I will establish your kingdom. But it was taken away. It was split into after Solomon died, his son became Rehoboam. And Rehoboam had a, 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 a advisors. They gave him a wrong advice. When the people came and said that we have so much tax, can you reduce it? And some godly people say, yes, listen to them. They will serve you. But there are young people who advise him that, no, tell them that I will be more harsh than my father. And that's what he listened to, the wrong advice, wrong counsel. And people rebel and they, they say, why we have to listen to you? And the kingdom, Solomon's kingdom, one united kingdom was split into two. So, Sami says that don't listen. The first step for happiness is don't listen to the wrong advice. Because everybody wants to give you advice. Everybody wants to give you advice. But be careful. But this person also, he delights in the law of the Lord. And verse 2 says that law, uh, he delights in the law of the Lord. And in his law, that they, he meditate both day and night. He delights in, 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 in the law of the Lord. Now, why somebody would like law? Why somebody would delight in the law? Nobody likes the law. Nobody likes the law. Nobody wants to be delightful in the law. But you can be only delightful in the law if you know who is giving you the law and what the heart of the lawgiver. If you know the heart of a lawgiver, if you know who is giving you the law, then you will listen. And when you will listen, you will reap the fruit of it. And when you reap the fruit of it, you will be happy. First, you need to understand the heart who is giving you the law. We, when, whenever we bring the babies in home, the hospital even doesn't discharge the baby if you don't have a car seat. Who likes the car seat? But we know that it is for their good. And we put the babies in the car seat. When you bring the baby at home, you put them in the crib. You don't just l let them lay anywhere. You put them in the crib. Why? Because there is a protection. You can enjoy the life within the boundaries. God is setting up the boundaries so that we can enjoy the life. It is not that God wants to punish us. When we understand what is the reason behind those laws that God is saying or giving us, if we understand his heart, he, the God's heart is to protect us. 
God's heart is to is to guard us. God's heart that we can enjoy everything that God has created. We can enjoy everything God has created. And that is why this uh, the, the man who delights in the law because he knows the heart who is giving the laws. God's heart is always good. He's always, we may not understand, but he is always looking after us. And then he says that... Uh, he delights in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate both day and night. Now, the word medi meditate, uh, we have with this understanding that meditation means you sit down, you close eyes, and you focus on something. That is our understanding of meditation. We might have some influence from the Eastern culture, and that's how they are. we are coming up to this understanding of meditation. However, the word here used he meditates on the uh, 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 on the law day and night. It's called Haga. Haga word, Hebrew word, is translated as a meditation or meditate. Haga is actually a growling. It's a, it's a very weird word, growling. Now, you know that when you give some favorite toy to your dog or some favorite food to your dog, you know, they, 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 they eat them, but also that time they will growl. They will growl with happiness. They will growl with satisfaction. You know, when, when a lion also, when they eat their prey and when they are biting the the meat, they're growling. That is haga. That is translated in our English as a meditate. They're chewing it. They're enjoying it. There is a goodness in it. They're satisfied. Joshua 1.8 says that um, in 1.8, God told Joshua that, that uh, meditate on these words day and night, then only you will be, you will prosper. Meditate, growl them, chew them, enjoy them. And why, why we have to chew them, why we have to bite them, why we have to growl them with satisfaction? Why? Roman 10, 17 says that, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith. So, so many people has this question that if I had a more faith, disciples also ask Jesus the same question, increase our faith. How we can increase our faith? What is the, what is the, what is the key, golden key to increase our faith? And Paul says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you just hear the word of God, you are growling, you are meditating, you are haggaying. And something happens. Something happens. And just faith increases. I cannot explain. But something happens. And what Bible says, so many times Bible says, those things does not make sense. Think about that a night of deliverance from the bondage of uh, bondage in Egypt. The Israelites, Moses told them, they cut the animal, take the blood, and they put the blood on the doorpost of your house. Now, why? Somebody would say that, why I wanted to decorate my entrance with the blood? But they did. And as many as people did, they all lived because the angel of death walked and it killed all the firstborn that night. But whenever he comes to the house and if it sees the blood on the doorpost, they will be passed on. And that's why it's called Passover. Certain things does not make sense. When Joshua and Israelite were standing, 
by the Jordan River, which was flooded that time in that season. God says that, let the Levite walk, carrying the Ark of the Covenant and stand in the water. They don't know what will happen. But as soon as they put their foot inside the water, the, the water, water departed. God says they circle around the wall of Jericho seven times, seven days and last days seven times, and then just shout, and the wall will come down. And it did. The people circle around seven days, seven times, seven, seventh day, and when they shout, the wall just came down. The big wall, fortified city, just came down. Bible tells about certain things we will never understand. But there are truth. There is a truth in it. Romans 10, 70 says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Just by hearing, just keep hearing, just keep hearing, just keep hearing, just keep hearing. Something will happen within you. Your faith will increase. So, Sami says, this man delights in the law of the Lord and his law, does he, he meditates. He growls them. He chew them. He eats them. And then he become. He has a life of joy, life of fulfillment. Verse three says that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. Bible says that this man, the happy man, the blessed man, how he become happy, how he become blessed, he is planted by the rivers of water. Now, there are so many rivers there, they got just a flash flood, and they just dry out. There are so many rivers that they are completely dry now and never get water. One time there was water. But the man is planted by the rivers of the water. It's like a tree that is planted by the river of water where he is continuing getting a water. He's being continually fed. This tree has to do only one thing, remain close to the river that is of, with the water. Not river with does not have water. Not with the river that has a sometime water in a certain season, but that has a river which has a water all the time. And that's how he become blessed. That's how he is becoming happy. John, in Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 55 goes like this. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Jesus says that apart from me you can do nothing. Nothing, nothing. Even you cannot, even you cannot decide I want to breathe, I don't want to breathe. It just automatically happens. You cannot decide my heart should beat, I should not, my heart should not beat. You have no control. You know that your heart doesn't uh, beat he will die. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We think that we are living our lives controlling by ourselves. Bible says that Jesus says that you can do nothing apart from me. Now, he says that the, the, the wine, he's, Jesus is giving the example of wine, that, that the branches has to do only one thing, remain in the wine to bear fruit. Branches does not have to struggle. So branches wake up in the morning and say, Oh my God, I have to work so hard to produce the, the grapes. I'll work so much. I will struggle so much. And pop, the grapes will pop out. Branch has to do nothing as long as branch is abiding in the vine, in the tree, it bears the fruit. So Jesus is saying that you don't have to struggle in your life. You don't have to cry 
in your life. You don't have to walk alone in your life. You don't have to be lonely in your life. You don't have to live a life that is broken. You don't have to live that has no hope. You don't have to live a life that has been for so long. That is not satisfying. Just remain in the branch. Just remain by the streams of water. And those, this, this man, the blessed man, the happy man, is like the, 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 the tree that is planted, planted by the river of waters. Jesus told that the woman at the well that the water which I will give, it, give to you, if you drink it, it will spring within you. You will never be thirsty again. The happiness people are looking for. The happiness we are chasing after through so many means will start flowing within, within inside. And the void we are facing, we are experiencing, will be fulfilled by Jesus only. John 15, 15 says, apart from me, you can do nothing. The happiness not will come from drugs. Happiness, not, happiness will not come from alcohol. Happiness will not come from cigarettes. Happiness will not come from so much sex. Happiness will not come from anything else. The happiness will come only through Jesus Christ. And then you don't have to struggle. It will just happen. And then it says that this tree will bear the fruit in his season. The fruit will come by itself. Fruit will come by itself. We don't have to work for it. Our happiness will produce our, our, our life become so alive, it will bear fruit and other people will be blessed. If you are struggling to forgive somebody, the forgiveness will flow by itself. If you have some bitterness that you cannot get over with, if you come to Jesus, that bitterness will just melt away. If people have done you wrong, it will be replaced by the the contentment from God. The things that we cannot change on our own, God will be able to do that. So, it will bear the fruit. And it says that, uh, Sami says that his leaf shall not wither. Now, these leaves no matter what season comes, will remain there. No matter what storm comes, the leaves will remain green. It will never wither. It will never wither. Your life will be so protected, so covered, so blessed, so happy, so fulfilling, that no matter what situation comes, even death, The happiness and joy will not go away. If you have watched this uh, movie called Ko Wadis, uh, so there is a beautiful scene in the movie where Emperor Nero uh, asked the Christians to be burned in the Colosseums or uh, to be fed to tigers and um, lions. And when the lions and tigers start attacking Christians, they started singing hymns. And Emperor Nero got so mad, he took this torch and goes and look at their faces. Every person who was dying, they have no fear, but they were joyful. In Book of Acts, we know about the, the disciple Stephen. When he died, he looked up and he saw the eye, sky open and Jesus is standing by the throne. This is the one time it gives us the glimpse that how we will be received. 
Jesus is not seated on the throne. We know that somebody, important person, when comes our home, we just stood up and go and greet them. I know that my son, whenever he comes home, now he lives a little away from us, whenever he comes home, I just wait that he's coming. And as soon as I know that he's pulling the car in, I'll run to the door. I will not sit in my couch. I'll go and hug him. And when Stephen died, Bible says that he saw the sky open and Jesus is standing. He's not sitting. Jesus is not sitting. Jesus is standing by the throne to receive Stephen home. So death will not take away the joy and happiness. For believers, death is behind us. Bible says that, oh death, where is your sting? Yes, there was a sting of death one time. But for believers, it is in the past. For us is the re glorious reunion with Jesus Christ and our loved ones. I don't know what will happen at the time of death, but we will not feel the pain because Bible says that Jesus has overcome the death. Death has no power on you and me. When we die, we will not experience the death. I don't know how it will happen. I, I believe we may have experience of this rapture or twinkling of eye, of nanosecond. We'll just leave this body and we'll be in the presence of the Lord. No more pain, no more suffering. The tree that is planted by the water of rivers, its leaves will not wither. And then Sami says that whatever, whatsoever he does shall prosper. Whatever, whatever you will do, you will prosper if you are walking with Jesus. Bible is full of those examples. Joseph is a great example. Was a sold in slavery. He went to Potiphar's house. And Bible says that, but God was with him. God was with him. Whatever he did, he was prospering. And the Potiphar, who was an Egyptian, he was a not Israelite, he did not know God, he noticed that there is something with this young man, Joseph, that whatever he is doing, he is prospering. So let me be wise and put everything, all my business is under his control. So, so I can prosper. The other people took a notice. And we know the story. He ended up the second in, in command in the entire Egypt next to Pharaoh. Nobody was above him. Whatever he did was prosper. The Bible says that whatever he did, he prospered. So if you are planted by the water of rivers, if you are connected with Jesus, if you are just abiding with Jesus, if you are just abiding in the, in the tree, you will prosper. Anything you will do, you will prosper. If you wanted to take a test, you see if you go to McDonald's or any store or any place, and if you notice that there is nobody, but as soon as you will walk in, the more customer will come. Why? Because the favor of God is walking with you. Wherever you are sitting, wherever you go, whether work or shopping or grocery or the, or the work you do, you are walking in the favor of God. You are highly favored once you are planted in that tree. But then, he's, the psalmist change the turn later on. It says that now the, the all this you heard about the person who is godly, who is blessed or happy, how he become happy, how he become blessed by all these things we just heard. But the other side, if we don't do it, if you don't follow it, if then what happens? That also Sam is pointing it out. So that we can listen and learn.
it says that uh, the un